Thank you, Susan. Um, so I'm going to try and make up a little bit of time here in going through this. Um, but I want to talk to you today about uh, some strategies that are being developed for treating patients uh, in these uh, in very selected situations uh, with a new form of, of therapy that's been developed uh, at multiple different centers, uh, including here uh, over the last few years. And this is partial gland ablation. So just to get at some of the definitions of what we mean by ablation, uh, so ablation comes from ablatus, or from the Latin, uh, which means amputation, to destroy or to remove. So this is surgery. So surgery, even a, a, a partial procedure that we do to excise or remove tissue uh, is considered a form of ablation. So this is something that, that comes up uh, when we talk to patients about uh, what we mean uh, with this form of, uh, of treatment. Um, and uh, as far as localized management strategies that we've developed for, uh, for treating uh, tumors in oncology and, and different types of neoplasms, partial resection or partial ablation surgery is considered a standard treatment in many cases. Uh, and this is really driven by a need to spare organs or, and a desire to, uh, to preserve normal function and quality of life. Uh, and it's particularly suited to very small, early, and lower risk cancers. And so we do this in partial nephrectomy cases, partial pancreatectomy, and so forth. And what's notable is when you go back and look at when all of these different treatments were developed, uh, they were all uh, uh, very um, uh, strongly opposed initially as being risky, uh, as being under treatment, and as putting patients in a compromised situation where we might not be able to recover them. And I'll get back to that a little bit later. In terms of just going through uh, the terminology of what we, why we call this partial gland ablation is because there's something called whole gland ablation. So whole gland treatment or whole gland ablation with radiation therapy or radical treatment with surgery uh, or whole gland cryotherapy has been around for a very long time. And so what we're really talking about here is really just a partial gland treatment or treating less than, than the whole prostate gland. Um, and we classify this here into two different areas. One is partial gland ablation, which is really a regional treatment of the prostate that's based on your understanding of where the cancer is inside the prostate gland, which may be confirmed with imaging studies. And that's different from an approach that people are calling focal therapy, which is really more of an imaging-based approach. And that is uh, similar to perhaps something like cryotherapy for kidney cancers, where you see a mass on a CT scan and you treat that mass uh, uh, specifically based on imaging. And so we put these two into different, if, different categories, and that's why we refer to this as partial gland ablation. Um, <clears throat> what we know about prostate cancer, and why is this something that's significant for us to approach, and that is that often prostate cancer is trivialized uh, in the setting of early disease, and yet we understand uh, that it's a leading cause of cancer death in men in the United States and, and elsewhere. But there are major challenges that we have yet to overcome, and I think you're hearing about those challenges today, and that's in the areas of, of screening patients and appropriate diagnosis, appropriate characterization of cancer, uh, properly risk stratifying patients into different categories and, and risk stratifying their, their therapies according to those uh, categories, the, the concerns about treatment toxicities, overtreatment, and the prolonged natural history of the disease. These are all major challenges that we're still struggling with uh, in the current era. Um, and th this uh, approach of conservative management for prostate cancer, including active surveillance and partial gland ablation, I would put into categories that address these areas, and that is uh, the risk stratification process, the toxicities associated with therapy, and the possibilities of overtreatment, understanding that the prolonged natural history of this disease uh, is also something uh, that is a challenge and something that we uh, face tangentially. Um, just to remind uh, people about where we are in terms of uh, prostate cancer care, and this is just data from the, the European ERSBC trial showing that uh, early detection has been shown to positively impact the disease. And that's um, because, uh, and while many people have, have argued about the data from studies such as this, early detection helps because it leads to early treatment. And even in a study like the PIVOT trial, which uh, many people like to cite when talking about uh, the risks for prostate cancer, we know that early detection and early treatment uh, matter for these patients in terms of endpoints such as metastasis-free survival. Um, but the oncologic risks, as you'll note, uh, are fairly minimal for most patients, and the treatment impact is modest. And so uh, this is the area where we're trying to uh, insert a new form of therapy to try and have a minimal impact treatment in terms of uh, quality of life impact for patients, and yet trying to develop trials that work in, in this very small space <coughs> here at the bottom of the graph. Um, and so because of this uh, aspect of, of active surveillance and conservative management has been shown already, active surveillance has become an increasingly attractive option. This is just data from here that uh, mirrors other data showing that patients are now uh, much more interested in this approach. Um, and that's because we're detecting cancers earlier. Uh, these are smaller volume, volume tumors. 
But it's also notable that these are often found in younger and younger patients because we're, we're moving the diagnosis curve uh, much earlier in terms of uh, where we're identifying cancers. Um, one thing that we don't talk that much about, and that is what is the hypothesis behind active surveillance? And when we assert to a patient that active surveillance is a safe and appropriate management strategy for low-risk prostate cancer, what the patient is hearing is that um, in selected patients with very low and intermediate-risk cancers who are observed, monitored, and selectively treated for evidence of what we call cancer progression, these are the, 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 the definitions that, that Dr. Lin pointed to just a moment ago, um, that there will be negligible risk and that they will be just as safe as those who are initially treated. And that's what patients are hearing when we're talking to them. Uh, to say, okay, if I go on this pathway, you're saying that you'll be able to identify something that's changing inside my prostate gland and, and intervene at the appropriate time, uh, and so my risk uh, may be negligible. But it's also implied in that statement is that we expect, uh, as was shown also before, and that is in an active surveillance, tr treatment is implied. And that is that if something does get worse, then patients should be aware that at that point, obviously, we'll intervene with some form of therapy. And that can be expected in somewhere between 30 to 60 percent of men uh, over a 10-year period. This, just, this slide just to remind people that um, this is not uh, a benign process, and this is something that came out of um, the European uh, uh, randomized trial uh, looking at watchful waiting versus active surveillance, and that is that even in young patients uh, who are put onto the active surveillance arm, about three times as many patients ended up going on to, um, on to hormone therapies within a six-year period of time uh, after the point of randomization. So the treatment that can go on, and that, this is not necessarily something that I would say happens in academic centers such as MSK or others, um, but in the community, uh, this type of, of uh, therapy and this burden of treatment in active surveillance is something that we need to pay attention to because while we can present data that comes from, from uh, academic centers that have uh, strict guidelines uh, in terms of managing patients over time, uh, this type of, of an event uh, can be uh, a major burden. And those who, who caught Dr. Um, Mulhall's talk yesterday talking about the uh, negative impact on androgen deprivation therapy for patients in terms of erectile function and bone loss would know that this is not just a minor event. And this also notably occurs in very young patients. And this comes from Freddie's trial just simply reminding us as well that uh, the, the idea that these patients are salvageable um, and that their risk is negligible and they go into active surveillance is not necessarily true, just simply showing that the progression, or what was called progression in the, in the, uh, in the uh, PROTECT trial, was uh, almost four times higher uh, in the groups of patients who underwent uh, active, surveillance, uh, active surveillance, despite the fact that up to 60 percent of these patients were treated over the 10-year period of the trial. And so the real-world consequences for these patients may be that conservative management is safe, uh, for the majority of men, and many people will point to this and say, yeah, but look at, you know, 80 percent of the patients down here did very well uh, without having to require any therapy. But there is a price that some patients will pay. And so how can we uh, help to improve on these outcomes uh, with new forms of therapy? And this is just a slide to remind us that there's also now a hint that maybe with some of the more conservative uh, approaches that have been taken, this is Jim Hu's paper, came out in uh, the JAMA uh, last year, suggesting that now there's a slight bump or something that may be happening where there's been a decrease, and they're, they're uh, suggesting this may be due to the changes that occurred as a result of PSA uh, testing and the uh, suggestions uh, to decrease PSA testing in patients that we may now be seeing a, a process occurring, especially in older patients, where the risk of metastasis may be, uh, may be going up. And um, this is just to remind us also that there are costs associated with active surveillance. These are different cost models that were put together, just simply looking that, yes, the cost for active surveillance can be low initially, but over time, as we start adding in things like MRI, repeated biopsies, uh, and uh, things that aren't being included that were discussed today, things like genomic studies, ancillary testing, and so forth, that these costs can start to mount as well as far as financial costs uh, when it comes to the long-term active surveillance. And when we're talking about the long-term management of patients, uh, men who are in their 50s, and those that cross over into therapy, we suddenly start to see that now we're adding uh, overall to, uh, to the cost curve. And so uh, can we come up with options such as focal therapy and partial gland ablation strategies that can not only impact the natural history of the disease, but can also start to bend the cost curve and become a value-added proposition uh, for this disease? And so this is what we sort of refer to as a swinging pendulum. This is the, the waffling that goes back and forth in terms of the approaches that we've utilized for managing cancer. This takes us back to the 1950s, 1960s, when we detected cancers late. Uh, and treatment was provided late, and we couldn't really cure these patients very effectively with the therapies we had. As we shifted more towards early detection, uh, at the same time, we never changed our strategies for management, and so we, we developed our early detection and early treatment as a model, 
And I think we did see a, a bend in a curve uh, in the curve in terms of uh, mortality related to prostate cancer. However, we also knew that toxicities and quality of life impacts have now shifted us somewhat back in the opposite direction towards selective screening and, sel and late selective treatment. And now the question is, is are we moving back in a direction towards uh, what we're now uh, looking at in, not just in prostate cancer but in other diseases, which is early detection and early risk stratified therapies. And um, I think what you're hearing from other speakers today is that hopefully we can hone in on a patient population that may benefit from early, less, in, less impactful therapies such as focal therapy. Um, these are just some of the realities of, of what we face in the clinic for those of us who, who deal with active surveillance in patients, and that is that the hard points of metastasis and death don't always reflect the true burden of what we're dealing with in terms of management, the anxiety that patients face, uh, the complications resulting from uh, repeated biopsies and so forth that can develop. Um, the relevance of existing data that we have may not be uh, there for young men who are young. I have patients in their late 40s and early 50s who are on active surveillance with Gleason 6 disease. And when I talk to them, and many of these are money managers who know about data, and when I start citing the, the papers that are out there, 15, 18 year, 20 year data in, in active surveillance populations, they say, but that doesn't apply to me because my life expectancy is 30 years. What does the 30 year data look like in somebody like me? And I would say we really don't have uh, quality data to be able to look in terms of what those long-term consequences might, might, might appear to be. These patients worry, obviously, about the missing of a window of opportunity for cure and what that might look like and the long-term impacts uh, may be. We talked just before about the reliability of observation strategies. How reliable are they? I don't think we really uh, particularly know that, although uh, Dan's group and others have done some great work in this area. Uh, but we can't, do we know that we can pinpoint the, the point of curable progression in patients effectively with imaging studies, with biomarker studies and so forth, to be able to do something uh, before the cancer gets worse? And why are the options that we offer binary? Why is it an all or none strategy? Why is it complete treatment of the prostate gland uh, as opposed to nothing whatsoever? And patients ask this all the time. Why do I have to choose between something so radical and something that's so nihilistic as nothing at all? And this is where prostate uh, partial gland ablation strategies may offer a low impact and potentially cost effective alternative, particularly in the front line of man uh, management of patients with small selective cancers. Um, this is just a reminder that uh, this comes from uh, Pete Carroll's group at UCSF, just showing, as was shown before, that the, the risk of upgrading uh, occurs at each uh, biopsy interval uh, at roughly about the same rate. And this is earlier data, um, but I think more recent studies also show uh, the same thing, and that depending on what your upgrade criteria might be, but these patients at each point in time that we follow them uh, are at risk for finding something more aggressive. And, and this may be a population of, of men where you say, well, look, at the point when you progress, instead of jumping into something like surgery or radiation, maybe if it's progression in terms of a small focal area of the prostate gland, we may be able to come up with, with a, a, a less impactful therapy that may be uh, potentially just as, as effective at, at managing your disease. Um, this is just a slide to remind us um, uh, that uh, this is based on the, um, on the uh, PROMISE data from uh, Mark Emerton's group showing that uh, MRI can be helpful at identifying cancers inside the prostate gland uh, based on uh, map, uh, transperineal map, mapping biopsy, biopsy data. However, uh, we still miss a percentage of these patients, about uh, 15 to 18 percent of patients with very, uh, uh, with very small, higher risk cancers uh, that aren't detected on MRI. And so that's where approaches such as uh, partial gland ablation, where we're regionally ablating a portion of the prostate gland around the tumor may be effective at, at hitting these small areas that can progress in the future and prevent patients from having to go on to more radical therapies uh, down the road. In terms of where these paradigms are being developed, uh, this is where they're being developed at, in, uh, highlighted here um, in, in clinical trials. Uh, it's been looked at in the active surveillance group and in low-risk Gleason 6 cancer. I think when starting out with new forms of therapies like this, you want to start in low-risk populations, and I think it's reasonable when we, start, when we first started developing trials to start looking in these low-risk patients in terms of surveillance. But since then, we've now moved on into the low-volume intermediate-risk cancers. Um, and this is where most groups are now working in terms of developing trials in partial gland ablation strategy. And the endpoints for these studies are things like converting uh, patients from uh, from the lower intermediate risk category into those who are now considered uh, low risk, and then those patients can avoid uh, more aggressive therapies such as surgery and radiation. The overarching goals in these tra treatments are uh, emphasizing quality of life and offering opportunity for early effective cancer control, but also, importantly, that if patients require more aggressive therapies in the future, such as surgery and radiation, those options are still available. And, and that's something that that patients are very uh, keen to make sure uh, are still on the table for them, and th something that we've been finding has been, uh, has been available to patients uh, in, in the uh, context of clinical trials.
This is what the MSK program looks like. So um, we are now treating uh, patients with Gleason 7 prostate cancers, that's 3 plus 4 and 4 plus 3 in, in the clinical trials that we're running at, at Sloan Kettering. Other groups are doing the same. Uh, the case selection criteria are based on unilateral cancers, so tumors isolated to one side of the prostate gland in one or two adjacent sextants of the prostate on that side, and up to 50% uh, cancer core length. And this, this number actually came from the data that, that um, or from the, the, uh, the ASCO guidelines that, that uh, Dan just uh, presented to you. And it is interesting because we tried to expand this somewhat higher uh, when we went through an FDA-approved trial for one of our uh, new therapies that we're providing, and the FDA pushed back and said, you really need to keep to this 50% uh, number because that's what they, they're now defining as sort of the, the low risk or low risk threshold in the intermediate gr uh, risk group. However, what was interesting is, as, as Dan pointed out as well, is that um, this criteria was developed in standard sextant biopsies. It was not developed in, in targeted biopsies or, or fusion biopsies. And so the FDA did give us leniency to be able to go above that threshold for specific targeted biopsies. And so we do go above that 50% threshold uh, when, tar when targeted biopsies are, are present. Um, PSA up to 20, uh, exam T2A. Uh, patients undergo an initial diagnostic biopsy to determine their eligibility. We do a confirmatory rebiopsy uh, with fusion uh, when there's an MRI uh, uh, lesion that's present. They undergo their treatment and then subsequently PSA testing and repeat biopsy to the primary endpoint of the study, uh, which is uh, endpoints of studies are, are biopsy based, uh, usually within six to 12 months after their initial therapy. Um, so I'm going to go briefly through some of the technologies that are, are being utilized in this, uh, in this space. Some of them are uh, energy-based. We, we broadly categorize them as, as thermal, so those are cryotherapies, laser, which creates heat, HIFU, radiofrequency ablation, and now some of the steam therapies that are being developed here. The non-thermal are those such as irreversible electroporation, which is electrocution of the prostate tissue, photodynamic therapy, or something called vascular targeted photodynamic therapy with a, an agent called 2CAD. And then there are mechanical ones such as uh, transruth resection embolization and histotripsy. Uh, uh, chemical uh, forms such as uh, ethanol injections, and now people are looking at biologics, retrovirals, nanoparticles, as well as uh, injection of drug therapies directly into the prostate gland. And so this is what you're going to be hearing about uh, as this field develops over the next eight to ten years. Um, we uh, have run multiple clinical trials here at Sloan Kettering. These are just uh, the list of what we've had uh, in the past. Uh, most of them are published. Uh, our two open trials are a HIFU trial that's being run by Dr. Day, and then uh, this is a 2CAD trial that's uh, recently opened here at MSK, uh, and we've started treating patients uh, within the last month. Um, <coughs> just to go through some of the, uh, the papers that have been published, and uh, I'm not going to go exhaustively through the list because they're all very similar in terms of what they're reporting, but in very highly selected patients, and this is uh, the group from USC, uh, Osama Okimura's group, looking at, uh, at focal ablation using cryotherapy. Uh, they suggested that uh, in this group, treating a, a mostly intermediate risk population uh, with 3 plus 4 and 4 plus 3 disease in tumors that were isolated to one half of the prostate gland, that when they treated uh, in these patients that the biopsy negative rate was roughly about 75 percent after treatment. PSA change was not good as a predictor for, uh, for biopsy recurrence uh, after treatment, uh, but showing very good quality of life outcomes in terms of continence and potency. Um, and that the, when they compared to a, uh, to a, a matched uh, pair radical prostatectomy group, that the salvage treatment rates uh, seem to be comparable. And so you can imagine this might be something that someone might want to put together as a, as a randomized prospective trial as, as outcomes comparing the two different groups. Uh, it's a sort of an interesting uh, paradigm that someone might use in terms of a randomized trial. Uh, but this su suggested that this is feasible, safe, and that close monitoring uh, was needed to follow patients afterwards. Um, Focal HIFU, this is a study out of uh, the Everton group and Hash Ahmed's uh, study, uh, looking at a preliminary group of 42 men, uh, relatively low PSAs, predominantly uh, intermediate risk prostate cancers uh, with um, prostate volumes less than 40 cc's. This prostate volume is an issue for HIFU in terms of the, amount, the size of the tissue that they can treat uh, in terms of the AP or the anterior posterior dimensions, and all patients had transperineal mapping biopsies. This sort of set the uh, uh, this is one of the trials that uh, kind of provides good uh, baseline data or baseline uh, 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 structure for any uh, prospective randomized trial. It has regular follow-up at uh, regular intervals, uh, looking at MRI and quality of life data in terms of ad and adverse events as well. And these are uh, 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 criteria that are used by most other uh, cl pro prospective clinical trials. Um, in this study, they showed um, excellent quality of life outcomes in patients afterwards. Biopsy positivity, uh, 
was uh, uh, negative in about 33% of patients uh, after treatment. Uh, so there was um, a, uh, about a 77% overall uh, success rate in this, in this group, sorry, it was a 23% uh, failure rate. Um, and uh, again, quality of life uh, outcomes were, were quite good. So uh, sexual function, urinary function, well preserved. Um, this is uh, Scott Egener's uh, focal laser ablation trial, also looking at very small, very discrete lesions identified only on MRI. So you had to have an MRI identifiable lesion to be treated in this study. The primary endpoint was uh, absence of, of cancer in the ablated area at three months after, uh, after the procedure. And they uh, demonstrated an overall 60% success rate, 90% local success in the, uh, in the treated area, uh, again, with excellent quality of life outcomes for patients afterwards. Uh, and these are the numbers you're going to kind of keep seeing over and over again in terms of highly selected patients and, uh, and uh, outcomes in the 70 to 80 percent range uh, appearing positive. This is our group with uh, IRE. Uh, we treated 35 men. Uh, we now have added an additional 50 men to this protocol. And so we have over 80 men that have been treated all, all together with IRE. Again, excellent urinary function outcomes, 84 uh, percent primary success rate, uh, meaning no cancer in the, in the treated area after treatment, and uh, grade three complications being rare with a very low impact in terms of quality of life. And um, this is, uh, importantly, the only phase three trial that's ever been done in this space, and this is Mark's uh, phase three trial of 2CAD VTP that was done in Europe, uh, taking a group of men, 204 men treated with uh, hemiablation with 2CAD VTP compared to 200 men that were placed on active surveillance. All these were low risk patients, the ones that were discussed earlier, all three plus three disease in, uh, in uh, less than uh, half of the prostate, less than half of the uh, cores in the prostate gland. Um, they looked at primary endpoints of progression, which they defined as higher volumes of Gleason 6 cancer or Gleason 7. Um, and they showed that there was a significant difference in terms of the progression rates that occurred in the two groups of the study based on the, the endpoint that they utilized. Um, their negative biopsy rates were uh, fairly high uh, in, the, uh, in the treated group. Uh, but importantly, uh, their main uh, progression in terms of what they saw in terms of worsening of disease was the finding of Gleason 7 prostate cancer in the two different arms of the study. Um, and that was sort of demonstrated here in terms of progression to Gleason 7 cancer, uh, only 25% uh, or 23% in the, uh, in the uh, treatment group, 43% uh, in, uh, in the active surveillance group. Um, predominantly, it was patients um, uh, with, or uh, uh, big changes were those with, with primary grade four, uh, so four plus three cancers, uh, um, uh, much higher in the uh, active surveillance group, or primary grade three plus four. This was an ad uh, post hoc analysis that was not presented in the initial paper. So, just to summarize quickly, um, prostate uh, partial gland ablation strategies for men. Uh, with prostate cancer are actually now becoming a standard therapy. So I used to have this slide as something that said that they're becoming a standard. These are actually now standard uh, in many uh, centers throughout the U.S. And I know tr uh, there are centers here in New York City who are treating patients routinely with cryoablation and focal cryoablation as, as something that's being considered standard of care. The FDA recently approved uh, HIFU uh, as a treatment for soft tissue ablation in the prostate gland specifically. And so that is now also taking on uh, a whole new uh, dimension of, of treatment uh, in the U.S. So there are not only trials being developed, but also um, these are being done in, in community centers as well. Uh, and Medicare has just recently uh, approved partial coverage for these procedures, so the, the, uh, the medical centers can actually get reimbursed through Medicare uh, for HIFU as a, as a uh, partial gland ablation strategy. Um, these are developing as initial strategies um, in, this, in salvaging patients on active surveillance, so those patients who are progressing on active surveillance. Uh, this is sort of the, the sweet spot where these patients are being, are, are, are being treated. Um, published outcomes from phase zero and one trials uh, shows feasibility and safety, and the preliminary data from phase two, three trials is promising in highly selected patients uh, in, in uh, specific uh, 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 morphologic types. Um, the longer-term data clearly is needed, and so there are papers from here and others uh, that are coming out with five, six, and eight-year data uh, looking at the long-term outcomes in these patients. And multi-center multi trials are being developed between uh, consortium partners that are working on, on this space, uh, and we have a, a very cohesive group of people that are trying to put together these trials, uh, you know, both here and internationally. And so just to, to wrap up, um, this is sort of the, the quote that uh, I, I remember finding this once when I was in, in college. And, I remember giving it to my dad, and he loved to use this one all the time because he felt that he was always right and no one else really quite got it. And then ultimately he was vindicated by, you know, outcomes of, of the work he had done. Uh, but saying that all truth passes through st three stages, and that is first it is ridiculed, uh, 
Uh, and I think we've been through that already with partial gland ablation. Um, and it's been tough to, to stand up and, and get you know, arrows thrown at you all the time, but, but, uh, and I still get them. Um, secondly, I think we're in this phase right now and we're being violently opposed. And that's actually not a bad thing because it keeps you honest and it makes sure that you do the appropriate studies to try and answer the questions appropriately. Uh, and that's what um, you know, we're, we're trying to develop here at the center and with our, with our uh, collaboration partners. And then hopefully we'll get to the third uh, part where it's accepted as being self-evident. Uh, and we'll be able to join uh, with our partners in, in places like bladder cancer where transurethral resection of the bladder uh, is performed. We know that recurrences will occur, but we can manage those patients appropriately uh, and keep them uh, from going on to more radical therapies uh, that can have serious quality of life outcomes. So I'll, I'll end there and thank you.